Good morning. Thank you for coming, for being here, for joining us today with this uh, presentation of the, the Power of Open, uh, the book that's been uh, written by Creative Commons, showing uh, some case studies of um, success, some companies, some organizations, some uh, creators that are making profit by opening their contents, by opening their ideas, by sharing with other people to innovate uh, with them. Uh, for us in the EOI school, the, uh, uh, this Spanish uh, business school devoted to, to open economy and uh, to open society, it's a great honor to have here as uh, guest speakers these three persons who are very relevant in the, in the whole world in this um, open movement. Uh, and I uh, introduce you to, to them. And then we, we will have some, um, some words uh, from them. Um, here we have uh, Javier de la Cueva, which is the, the first lawyer uh, winning a cause, defending uh, copyleft, uh, defending the use of uh, open content, um, using license, open licenses in the, in the world. I know, yeah, not only in Spain, it was the first sentence in the world. Uh, with the case of La Dinamo in Madrid a few years ago. And he's a very well uh, person, very, uh, very well known, sorry, person in, in Spain, uh, defending free culture and defending uh, open licenses. Uh, then we will have uh, Lisa Green, which is, um, who is uh, the chief of Creative Commons. She just came to Spain for this event. Yeah, she just arrived uh, yesterday, and she's the, uh, the person behind the book. She's the, the one uh, trying to set everything up to, to have these um, uh, this, uh, uh, gorgeous uh, stories in the book. I've been working with her since uh, last week. Um, we didn't know each other before, but we've been sharing a lot of uh, mailing this week uh, with the, uh, the text and the translation. Spanish. Today um, we also present the Spanish version, which is uh, which is going to be online at the uh, the address of the um, the Power of Open Book on Monday. Yeah, you you will be uh, you will be able to download the Spanish version. And then we have our main guest speaker, who's uh, Joy Ito. Uh, he's uh, very well known in the blogosphere culture. Um, because he's a very well-known blogger and a very well-known um, entrepreneur. And now he's also the director of um, um, uh, MIT Media Lab. And it's a great honor to, um, to have uh, his visit uh, to our school because MIT is a um, great reference for us. It's a, it's a good mirror. Uh, to work in uh, innovation and to work in um, open, open content and open culture. And he's also the chairman of uh, Creative Commons. So it's a, a really, really opportunity for us in this school, um, in our um, big project trying to transform society through uh, open economy, open new business models to have these uh, speakers today. So thank you for coming to all of you. And now I just give the, the microphone to Javier, who's going to introduce the uh, Creative Commons movement in, in Spain and how we are in, in, the, in the war scenario. Thank, thank you. Yes, here. Um, well, thank you very much for your invitation, first of all. It's, been an, it's an honor to me to be with you and to meet people who I just know because of the net. And uh, you forgot to say some of the most important things that I also teach here. Okay, so uh, that's something that should be uh, said. Um, I would like to um, emphasize uh, into, uh, well, some aspects of how are we dealing with creative commons here in Spain. Uh, the first thing that we have to say is that we don't have to be afraid of openness, okay? Openness is um, a cornerstone of democracy. 
Democracy only can function and only free markets can function if we have openness. And the first movement that we have, uh, historically speaking about openness, is the law. The law has no copyright. Legal resolutions have no copyright, so we can copy the law and we can copy the resolutions. And there's plenty of market when you see some people who are people who live because of the law. We've got lawyers, we've got uh, civil servants, we've got politicians, we've got the executive, we've got the uh, legislature, we've got plenty of people who live because this open and very wide, broad openness that's got the law. So the law is a market where people do things, people uh, play services, play roles, and it works perfectly. Okay, and that is the first keystone that we should mention because of uh, the uh, because uh, how does the openness is related with with markets. The second thing that I would like to s to speak about is how are we dealing with these things in Spain? Spain, we are leaders in works in Creative common works. Mm, this could be uh, well, I don't know exactly the reason why we lead this thing in the world, but the statistics in Creative Commons just say so. Well, and of course these statistics are not some kind of um, magic figure, because uh, when you take your Creative Commons license and you paste it inside your web or in your uh, work, what you have is those tags RDF, okay, that are underneath the icon, so when Google comes and uh, parses the website, Google can count exactly how many works you have. That's first of all. Second, uh, we have also, uh, we are the country where more legal resolutions we have that deal with copyleft and with creative commons. How did we do this? Well, very simple. All the writings and all the um, resolutions, everything that was obtained from battling against uh, collecting agencies was free um, published on the net under Creative Commons. So when a lawyer needs to defend a case uh, for Creative Commons, just goes to the net, takes everything that's there, takes it for free and takes it also libre. So just use it and then push it on. So Spain is leading also judicial resolutions uh, with, um, uh, that, had, that are related with Creative Commons. And uh, another third thing is how creators work here in Spain. We are in this, um, this uh, place where it, it depends from the Ministry of Industry of Spain and uh, uh, well, they, we are always publishing and we are always <coughs> um, speaking about Creative Commons in our classes. We are speaking about the openness and how to make things open and what are the, what are the things that we can do for open, what can enrich us. And for example, there's also in Spain another uh, master in free software uh, that's leading, and here we've got uh, Professor González Barahona, who's the leader in these things. Uh, but also in Spain, we had uh, 17th of April, the first documentary that was uh, communicated in the TV called Copiad Malditos, and here we've got Stefan, who is the director of this documentary in the public Spanish television. So Creative Commons is just going round and round, and it's just like an octopus that's going through every single system of Spanish society. We're speaking about schools, we're speaking about universities, we're speaking about authors, and we're speaking about, and we could speak about other places. For example, Media Lab Prado, Marcos Garcia as always, as I've seen Marcos around here. And uh, there's another place where every creator is licensing under Creative Commons. So there's a very, very strong movement that's outside uh, in, in, in the streets where you can find people who are licensing under Creative Commons. But Creative Commons is also so spread that it was really, really um, astonishing that when this social movement called 15th M happened in Spain, there was people who were um, asking for uh, photoprints or sorry, for photographs and the condition that there was written there was everything is going to be published under Creative Commons. So Creative Commons is on the top of the society, on the top of engineers, on the top of the brains of everybody, and even though in the high and very spread around the society, and especially also in the judges. I remember, just I'm going to finish, once in Malaga, so I went there, there was this um, problem about intellectual property, and um, well, uh, it wasn't about Creative Commons, it was about another aspect. So and then I asked as a proof that we would like to mm, well, bring here uh, an expert about Creative Commons. So the judge said, I don't need that proof. Uh, all the judiciary in Spain know what Creative Commons is. Thank you very much.
Okay, so thank you, Javier. Now we have uh, Lisa, who's going to introduce us uh, deeper in the, in the book, in the process of the book, and in the meaning of the book. So please, Lisa, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is, sorry, my name is Lisa Green, and I'm at Creative Commons in San Francisco. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today because of the things that Javier talked about, about the Spanish culture and the progress and the innovation in the Spanish culture, but also at EOI, which is an uh, amazing school of teaching open business and open economy, and I'm very happy to be here today. So Creative Commons first license was launched uh, nine years ago, and in the nine years since, we have now learned a lot about openness and the power of open. We have 400 million works licensed under Creative Commons on the internet. And we've learned most of the things that we've learned from our users, from the people who have applied these licenses. Nine years ago, when we launched that first, should I switch to this handheld? Is yours on? Is your mic on? Is it? Making okay, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, it sounds funny to me. Uh, nine years ago, when we launched the first license, it was a great idea, and we were looking at how will you manage content in a digital world. But we weren't really living fully in a digital world the way that we are today. Today, we are absolutely living in the digital world, and Creative Commons is more important than ever. In the nine years since our first license, we have gone from an idea to an essential piece of infrastructure in the digital world. So because this is so important now, more important than ever, we decided to share the things that we have learned over the last nine years. And we thought the best way to share these things is by collecting the stories of the people that use them. So we took 31 case studies. And uh, I hope, it, as uh, Tiskar said, the book is available in Spanish. As of Monday, you can download it on the website, thepowerofopen.org. It's in nine languages. And uh, I hope that you will go and read them and see the, these studies and be inspired by them. Uh, but as you read through them, there are certain things that come up over and over. There's a feeling that you get after you read these 31 case studies. And I just want to say a couple of these ideas before I hand over to Joey. One is that there is a very broad spectrum of choices for the creator to exercise their copyright. Some people will frame to you that there is a polar, discrete choice. either completely open or completely closed. And we found that that's not true. There is a wide range of choices. You can, we have six different licenses, and you can use them in multiple ways or in combination, and the creator has the power to choose how they will exercise their copyright. Joey earlier today described Creative Commons as a user interface for copyright. Creative Commons sits on top of copyright. It is not a replacement. It's a user interface that allows you to more easily exercise your copyright in the way that you choose. So as you read the stories and you see all the different licenses that people choose and the way that they exercise their copyright, that message becomes very clear, that there are choices in between in a large spectrum. Another uh, theme that becomes very clear here is that Creative Commons enables new digital business models, new business models suitable for the digital age. So many people think that uh, Creative Commons is about giving everything away for free and is incompatible with business somehow, maybe not in Spain where you understand Creative Commons very well, but this is a misconception that I think people have. And in this book you'll find many examples of people who are building economically sustainable businesses on top of the Creative Commons tools and infrastructure. Uh, and one of my favorite stories in this book is Al Jazeera. So Al Jazeera uses open uh, licensing for their video content. Sometimes they use a Creative Commons non-commercial license, which means that you can use the video, but not for commercial purposes. 
This means you could embed the video in, say, Wikipedia or use it in a classroom. But if another news agency wanted to use it, they would have to make a contract with Al Jazeera. So they can make money in their traditional way at the same time as sharing. Recent I'm sorry. Recently, when there were problems in the Middle East and Al Jazeera had the best footage, in some cases they were the only people with a camera crew on the ground in some places, they made a decision to release this video footage under the most liberal CC license, CC BY. This calls for attribution only. You can do whatever you like with my content as long as you give me credit. When Al Jazeera did this, it was picked up by many other news agencies. First of all, it would, could happen immediately. There was no need for one news agency to call Al Jazeera and the lawyers to talk and the contracts and the delay. Immediately, they saw CC BY and they knew that they could broadcast it so the world could see this footage. The benefit for Al Jazeera, you say, but they're a business. Why would they give this away for free? How can they make money off this? But the benefit for Al Jazeera was distribution, reputation, and impact. And this is another message that comes out over and over again when you read the stories of the power of open, that in the digital economy, money is not the only key metric. These things, distribution, reputation, impact, they're increasingly important in the digital economy. So Al Jazeera benefited tremendously from sharing their video. They are still a commercial organization. They still make money. But by sharing and openness, their business model benefited. And if you read the book, I hope that you will, you'll see many examples such of this. So uh, please go to thepowerofopen.org. You can read about the, more about the book and download free copies. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And now uh, we have Joy, who's, um, well, I, I say before, he's the director of the Media Lab at MIT and the chairman of Creative uh, Commons. Um, I had the opportunity to, to listen to, to his talk last night at the, um, the BBVA event. And also this morning, we've been talking about open economy and open society and how to uh, get more innovation by putting people together and by um, by trying to um, to be more diverse and more open to, to this uh, development. Um, well, this is our last talk and the uh, one of the the most important that we we have had here in in our school. And it's a great pleasure to to listen to your talk now. Thank, Thank you. you Joy. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to actually talk a little bit about history first because in the late 80s I started getting involved in the internet. I was actually in mainstream media before doing motion pictures, television, journalism uh, and when I first saw the internet starting, when I first saw a PPP and I first downloaded the images from the NASA satellite and I downloaded I, I don't know if everyone is probably too young for, to remember this, but there was a site called MTV.com, and there was a, uh, uh, a DJ named Adam Curry, and he had these s stupid videos uh, that were QuickTime that you could download from the internet and you could see. And I remember going to the chairman of NHK, which is a Japanese broadcasting company, and I downloaded this video and I showed him. And he said, who owns this network? And I said, no one owns this network. And he said, does Murdoch own this network? And I said, no, Murdoch doesn't own this network. And he said, can I own this network? And I said, no, you can't own this network. And that was when I realized that the me big media guys were not going to understand the internet, and the internet would change everything. And I was a young, I was probably a teenager back then, and I was about to start my career in mainstream media, and I decided I'm going to build the internet because that's going to be much more interesting and about when I get to the right age, we'll have built the internet. And the internet, from a technology perspective, is layers. It's like a big pancake. And so first thing you have to build is the network. And so I was very involved in the first commercial internet service provider in Japan, was the first CEO. And when we were trying to build the internet in Japan, uh, 
if, again, this is old history, but the UN had a thing called CCITT, which eventually became the ITU, but it's the telecommunications body of the United Nations. And they had their own kind of version of something that looked like the internet. It was called X25. And most of Europe was working with this sort of UN system. And Japan was doing it. But the Americans decided they're going to go do this um, uh, military-funded crazy thing called the internet, which had less control, didn't have an international government um, thing. It was actually ad hoc and kind of this crazy thing. But we believe that the internet was a much better model because instead of spending years and years with experts trying to define some huge specification that some big telephone company would implement, internet, the Internet Engineering Task Force, where we were, they were designing the protocols, the credo <coughs> was called Rough Consensus Running Code. So you'd kind of come up with a general idea, and then you'd write the software. And then as you wrote the software, it would start to evolve. Whereas the uh, old UN method was you have many experts to get together for years and years and years, and you create a specification that anticipated every problem, every risk, every feature. It was about this high, and no individual could ever build the software. You had to have the big companies, and big companies that paid big tax with big governments and big labs. And the internet was, David Weinberger uses the term, small pieces loosely joined. Most of the in essential elements of the internet, whether it was FTP or the TCP IP stack, they're all designed by groups of three or four people, two or three people, and they all connect together in this loosely defined open protocol, and anyone can participate in the ITF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. Teenagers can write code, teenagers can participate, big companies, governments, it's a very flat organization, and the governments and big companies hated it because it was open, anyone could participate, no one had permission, and the telephone companies, if you remember in the old days, they didn't let you connect anything to the telephone jack without a stamp from the government. If you couldn't, you, modems had to be authorized by the government. And so the whole idea was before it was centrally planned, very uh, carefully selected companies, carefully selected experts, and it was important because they were spending so much money on the infrastructure, they were afraid that hackers or bad people would destroy this network. And it's a fundamental philosophy difference of central planning, closed and control versus open chaos, um, you know, access without asking permission, innovation without asking permission, very much about openness, right? And the early days when we were trying to set up the internet in Japan, the lawyers said this is illegal, the technology people said this would never work, the economists said, oh, who's going to pay for this? And the internet was basically written off in Japan as impossible. And I think in Europe it was a very similar argument. But we built the internet and we won, right? And what we found by winning on the internet is you don't have to control everything. You don't have to know the whole of it. Each person works on their own piece, takes responsibility for their own risk, uses open protocols to connect with each other, and you have this open innovation, open competition. It dramatically lowers the cost. Now, one problem with lowering the cost, one person's cost is some other person's revenue. So the phone companies and a lot of people that used to generate a lot of revenue and a lot of margin by overcharging because they had monopolies now suddenly lost this revenue. So some people lost some money. But I think everyone will agree that in the long run, the internet has generated more economic growth, more civil society value than if it didn't exist, right? We have, I think the internet is a net positive effect. And today we don't argue whether the internet is good or bad. You know, we argue about certain policy decisions, but the internet is no longer a political discussion about whether we should do internet. Sometimes we discuss why, how we should do internet. It's very similar with Creative Commons. So Creative Commons is another layer. I, well, I'll go one more layer before I go to Creative Commons. So when the World Wide Web came out, um, and Tim Berners-Lee proposed the World Wide Web, before that, we had Gopher, we had databases, we had all these different ways we can access data. And I remember all the computer scientists saying, World Wide Web is stupid. We can already do everything. We have documents, we have links, we can do everything. Why should we make it so easy that you can click and that anyone can make a web page? We already have professionals who know how to make these databases. But by creating the World Wide Web, what we had was the teacher can make their own web page and users can create their own web page. And all of a sudden, we democratized the ability to make websites that d distributed content. And suddenly, we had an explosion of innovation just by lowering the friction and by creating an open standard that anyone could understand. Because before the World Wide Web, you had things like SGML and Gopher and all these things. You had to be an expert 
in order to create any kind of content or put content on the web. And you had to hire somebody. The web basically made it so that anyone could create a web page. And again, this is the critical value that also is often misunderstood is by lowering the cost, the internet has allowed collaboration that didn't exist before. Linux exploded because it came out just around when the internet was exploding. And so all of these programmers could collaborate at a very, very low cost. If they had to send in the old days open source, you send paper tapes by mail. So the universities could do open source, but the average kid at home couldn't participate in open source. But with internet suddenly open source, you could have millions of people participating. And in the same way, the, the web allowed millions of people to participate rather than just hundreds of people. And the lowering the cost is essential because it lowers the cost of failure and it lowers the cost of innovation. Because one of the things that we know from venture capital is that, you know, so I'm an investor in Twitter and I've talked to the other Twitter investors. And, you know, to be honest, nobody would have said Twitter is the one. You know, we like Ev and it was an interesting investment, but we all feel lucky, right? We make hundreds of investments and some of them succeed. But the ones that succeed are not obvious. You know, last FM, I didn't had no idea that that would be that successful. And some of the companies, like Six Apart, that I thought would be super successful, still hasn't exited. You know, and it's very, it's you never know, right? And the thing that we re know from all of the great things that are happening, all the bad things that are happening, the financial crisis, the Arab Spring, you never know, right? No one, some people would have predicted, but it's random. The, the only way that you deal with the complexity of today is you have to place a lot of bets. And how do you place a lot of bets? You place a lot of bets by lowering the cost of placing the bets. And you lower the cost of placing the bets, and you lower the cost of taking risks by lowering the cost of collaboration, the lowering the cost of production. And I think that this is something that people forget. It takes a lot of energy for a big company to do what we say, swing the bat, right? So a big Japanese company that I know, you know, it takes them $3 million to think about whether to do something. Right? Whereas the average startup company is about $100,000 to start up. The average free software project is zero to start up. And so you can try many things. Like Wikipedia, no one would have, venture capitalists would have given Wikipedia money. Oh, we're going to make a website. Anyone can edit, and we'll be the biggest encyclopedia in the world. That doesn't sound like a business plan that somebody would give you money for. But they now are able to raise money. They have become one of the biggest sites in the world. It's only in retrospect that it becomes obvious that things like Wikipedia happen. So in order to think about just generally, fundamentally, innovation drives the economy. Um, and that innovation it requires um, taking lots of risks. And taking lots of risks requires lowering the cost of participation, lowering the cost of innovation. And lowering the cost of participation means lowering the barriers, which also includes the a requiring asking permission and um, open access. And so making, giving access to the legal documents giving access to um, educational materials, giving access to code, all of these make it so that more and more people can innovate. You know? And so on the education side, and this is where Creative Commons starts to come in, is that now the next layer up where everything is locked up is the copyright layer. There's so much stuff. So, so you're lucky because the, the, you know, the Spanish government knows you shouldn't copyright the law um, because obviously it's, it's, it's the commons. But in many countries, stuff that's funded by taxpayer money it's copyrighted. I had this insane argument with a public broadcaster who was trying to sell content that they were producing in public broadcast. And I said, well, no, it should be free because um, the taxpayer paid for it. And he said, no, 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 but we have to um, pay for the distribution system. And I said, well, why don't you just put it online? And he said, no, no, because we have to charge and we have a billing system. And I said, well, why do you have a billing system? Oh, because we have to pay for the infrastructure. You know? <laughs> and it's this kind of very stupid thing that you don't realize that you get into these kind of modes when people re think that everything has to make some money. You know? and, and there are many ways that sharing is very important. And, and in, in education, I think it's also essential because in the old days, you know, to bring students to a school like this for you know, the illustrated you know, manuscripts to be shared, the cost of spreading information about education and the cost of having these kind of meetings was so high. But now we're live streaming it. You know, anyone can view this. Anyone can ask Twitter questions. We can put videos online. We used, we, so the institutions of education were designed in a period of scarcity. When, you, when it costs so much money to educate one person, you had to pick the smartest kids in society in order to make the investment to educate them. And then they became the next uh, sort of custodian of this. 
this uh, flow of knowledge from the past to the future. But today, we're in a world of abundance where anyone should have access to educational materials. But I think the physics journal, I think, costs about $18,000 a year to subscribe. So if you're a young student in a developing country, you don't have access to any of the uh, major scientific publications because the cost is too high. Now, obviously, the academic journals are very important because in the past, they were the messengers that connected Cambridge to this university, to MIT, and they were the, the infrastructure where all of this knowledge was shared. They had an essential role. But now in the days of the internet, suddenly these people who have the copyright on these academic journals, they're the ones that are erecting the walls and making it so that everyone doesn't have access to this academic work. Now, I can understand the business reason for that because they need to make the money to print the things to do the... But if you think about it from a much higher perspective, is there any really good reason that science should not be available to everyone in the whole world, especially if we're hoping that innovation can come from anyone in the whole world? And now with the cost of innovation going down so low and the ability for people to collaborate so much, one of the biggest problems I see is that this access to knowledge is being blocked by, um, um, by, these, by these business models. Now, the thing, the thing that Creative Commons can do is help to try to move these business models from the old model to the new model somewhat slowly. So you can say, first, if you have to make money, let's say um, you have to collect money from commercial institutions, maybe you make the non-commercial rights available so that people who want to access the works uh, as individuals can do so. And then you, know, you have organizations like Al Jazeera who gave it all away, and then they'll tell you they actually made more money. And so some of these people can take the plunge and try to make money. But I think what's essential to think about as we think about it from a higher level, from a civil society perspective, is we're going from a world where it, it used to cost too much money to distribute information, therefore we had to erect a business model to do that, to a world where the distribution of information is nearly free, and there's so much value to society of sharing information, but in order to go from here to here, we have to have several transition steps. Um, I think you know, journalism is another very important one, because journalism is probably one of the fundamental um, components of open democracy where you have, to, you have to be able to be critical of authority, you have to be able to dig into this stuff. But the problem is, right now, journalism is wrapped around printing presses and transponders and a lot of these physical assets and this huge management, which is often inside of a content company. And content companies, by the way, are very short-term, right? They're, they're often public companies, they're looking for short-term revenues. Journalism should be long-term. You know, journalism should be, I'm writing about this thing, you may not be interested in it. And then a year later, you say, you know, they were right, right? It's, it's a long-term bet versus a short-term bet. And also, journalism should have a much higher calling. It's, it's a fundamental function of, of democracy, not just a fundamental function of business, right? And so the, the question is, so Al Jazeera is an interesting example because they're state-run. Um, they do make some money. But there's a question is, should journalism be part of uh, public commercial companies? Should it be state-run? Should it be a nonprofit organization? Should it be journalists as individual um, citizens who make a business model of uh, being funded directly? There, there are a lot of questions about how journalists should work, and I think there's a lot of experimentation. The interesting thing is I think the experimentation is happening more among the amateurs and less among the big companies. I think the big company journalism is, is a, there, there's some experimentation, but it's ex experimenting assuming that the management doesn't lose their job. You know, and if you look at the 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 the, the P and Ls and the balance sheets of the big media companies, generally, on the P and on the balance sheet, the biggest assets are buildings and printing presses or studios and transponders, and most of the costs go to distribution and management, and the smallest chunk is to the journalists, right? And so, so I think you know, if you rethink this whole journalism model. Now, to get back to where Creative Commons comes in is it, it, it allows a lot of hybrids to happen. It allows um, media institutions to share some of their data. It allows citizen um, media to share um, content into journalism. And I think what's going to be very important is, again, to experiment with a lot of different models, to try to mix citizen journalism with professional journalism. And the problem right now is with the all rights reserved uh, model, which is without Creative Commons, it's, it's not very flexible. Um, because what, you, what it requires, it requires that you have a, tra a, a legal transaction every time you want to do something. So for instance, if I want to contract a journalist, 
we have to exchange a contract. Um, and if I'm asking you, I want to use your material just for this thing, I'm going to send you a Japanese contract. You're going to get a translator. The translator is going to translate it. It's going to take us time and money. And actually, it probably will cost more money for in legal fees than the value of the transaction. And, and similarly, if two institutions, if we want to do a co-production between a S Spanish television show and a Japanese television show, I'm sure that that cost of the legal fees, that this used to be my business, um, the legal fee would be $20,000. And so this gets back to the very similar value of the internet and the web, is the friction, the cost of the transaction now to do collaboration and sharing is so high that it makes it almost um, doesn't make any business sense. And what Creative Commons is trying to do with the six licenses that we have is to reduce the, uh, the, the common types of transactions. You may use this for non-commercial use. You may use this, but don't create derivatives. You may use this, but you have to share back. And we're trying to, we try to identify the main categories of decisions that people like to make when they're sharing and reduce them into s simple icons and simple contracts that anyone can use because the law is very difficult. I mean, I think that copyright law was originally designed to prevent companies from exploiting other companies because copying used to be something that only big companies did, only printing presses did. But now with the internet, everybody copies. Um, every time you look at a web page, you're actually copying it, right? And so it's a very complex law that really wasn't designed to be used by individuals. And so that's why I use the word um, in, uh, user interface for copyright. Right? Creative Commons is also trying to make it so that the individual creator or the individual user can understand and express their decisions uh, using Creative Commons. Now, we, in the book, we call it the power of open. And Creative Commons definitely has a tendency to like things to be open. But as a technology, and this is, again, very similar to the internet, we're not trying to force people to give away their rights. Okay? So, so if, if you are making, if you're not making business sense, as an individual, I will argue with you and say, you know, you'll make more money if you make it open. But I'm not trying, one of the big mistakes, I think, not mistakes, but uh, misconceptions is that we're trying to make people give away their stuff. And, and that's not true. What Creative Commons is doing is saying, you have made a decision about how you want to use your copyright. It's still always your copyright, but we are giving you the legal tools and the technical tools to express your decision. And that's really all Creative Commons is. Now, we have an opinion about whether something should be open or closed, so it's a little bit tricky. But we don't like to push this opinion on everyone else. If you ask us, we'll tell you our opinion. But we are trying to transition more and more into an infrastructure which is just a way to legally and technically express people's rights. And we're actually working very closely with other rights organizations. So in the United States now, the Motion Picture Association, the record, uh, the RIAA, they have all started to be supporters of Creative Commons because they believe this idea that uh, your decisions should be expressed technically and legally in a robust way. And because Creative Commons is friendly with the World Wide Web Consortium and the open standards, we've started to create these um, technical standards that allow copyright to be expressed inside of the HTML. And we led the movement in this. And this is not just for Creative Commons. It allows strong copyright owner, um, copyright licenses also to be expressed in this language because we believe that it's important to have an interoperable standard. And this is another uh, key thing, because a lot of the copyright people that we talk to create copyright licenses and create these standards and icons and things like that. But to have a machine-readable, interoperable standard is essential. Having one internet is why internet is great. If we have five internets, a Spanish internet and a Japanese internet, it's not really internet. And one of the big problems that we see is a lot of people say, OK, I'm going to make my own license. You know, like. Uh, we'll use Creative Commons, but we'll change this. Or a lot of universities like to add this or add that. But interoperability is very important because what you want is you want Google or all of these other guys to be able to find all of the licenses that they can use. And if you prolif we call it license proliferation. If you have many licenses that look like Creative Commons, then you can't connect. Because so the, a good example is Wikipedia. A few year, until a few years ago, Wikipedia had a license that was very similar to Creative Commons. It was called the GFDL. It was created by the Free Software Foundation for distribution of their manuals. And GFDL is almost the same as Creative Commons share alike. It says you can do anything you want with this as long as you share it back. The problem is GFDL, it's shared back under GFDL. And many 
professors and, and schools were using Creative Commons Share Alike that said, you can do anything with this content that you like as long as you share it back. But share it back under each license, you can't mix these two. It's almost like, you know, Islam and Christianity and Judaism. They all believe in God, but it's slightly different gods, you know. And so the problem when you split the root is that you create islands that don't mix. And so this sounds a little bit imperialistic, but it was very important to get Wikipedia to switch to a Creative Commons license. It took us nearly five years to do this. But now that Creative Commons is being used in Wikipedia, all of the Creative Commons content now can be mixed with Wikipedia. So, uh, you know, I want to make a, a point because some, some people, I think, like when I'm in the Middle East, they say, well, this is an American institution, you know. I said, no, 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 this is an international institution. You know, we all have to use the same Creative Commons. Otherwise, we're creating islands. So, again, this, this is the idea about open standards. And it, it's, it's the, the value of open standards goes all the way back again to the cost of um, collaboration, the cost of risk. Because unless you have that open standard, the gateways add this additional cost. And so since I'm at the business school, I wanted to focus a little bit on the value of innovation and the value of the economy. And what you find in the examples in the book is these are people who are innovating using sharing, using open. And, but I think that in, in addition to um, you know, these examples here, I know that Spain has, you said, has the most licenses. We really would like to see and maybe ex discuss now in, in, um, and explore with you ways to build examples in Spain um, of people building ecosystems, people making money. Because I think what I'd really like to do, which is very important, is Creative Commons is, and in many places, used to be more a battle. It was always a fight. It was always a debate. I always got invited to debates. you know. But lately, we're getting invited to help, to consult, to support. And so I think that that's also very important to try to find some allies in the business side um, to try to create some examples where um, Creative Commons is helping uh, 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 an, an ecosystem that wasn't traditionally uh, sort of open group. Thank you, Joy. Uh, now, since this is an open event, uh, celebrating the, the open movement, we want also to, to make it open to you so you can into, uh, you can talk with us, you can ask questions, you can just um, talk to them and, and create a little debate here. Uh, we also offer uh, some questions to, um, to people watching us on live streaming. Uh, so if anybody else uh, is there and if he wants to, if, he, if they want me to um, send the, the question to, um, to our speakers, so it's very easy just using the, the hash and replaying to me or just with the hash, I will bring it to, to the speakers. So it's your turn and I guess I will give you the, the microphone. Okay. So who wants? Okay. We go first here and we bring the, the microphone. <coughs> Yeah, uh, thanks to the, to the panel, and uh, I'm here. So uh, maybe a question, and you refer, Joy, to the, to the media, and uh, I think we all know the importance of uh, independent media and the role they play in society. I mean, I can't, I, I have, I'm struggling to see the, the, the kind of the sustainability of the, the business model for media and, and how it's, it's going to happen. I mean, like the, the big group, as you mentioned, are struggling in many ways with online, not online, paper, no, no paper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at the end of the day, who's going to be paying the salaries of, uh, the, of journalists? And, mm -hmm. and having good journalists, we know it's important. So I don't know how you see this. Yeah, yeah. So I don't have the answer, but I have a few hints. And, you know, it, it reminds me just about, so I, I've been a privacy advocate for, this is sort of a tangent, but it, it's related. I've been advocating privacy forever, but no one wants it because no one really cares, the users. They don't, they've never felt the pain. Eventually, the users will feel the pain. It's the same with spam, same with security. And when the users feel the pain, then they will pay for it, right? And so you have to wait until, the, so it's going to get bad. 
And it's just like the ecology, too. When you start to notice the global warming and it becomes undeniable, then people make, try to change. Journalism, I think that in Western um, countries, people don't yet realize the importance of journalism at the level that it should. Once they do, I think the new business models will emerge. And the, the place where I see the difference is if you s talk to, at Al Jazeera, for instance, from Tahir Square, a young activist called Wada, the director general of, of Al Jazeera, and said, don't turn off the cameras. We will die if you do. Please leave them on all night. And I was just in Tunisia talking to them. To them, the ju it's water, food, shelter, journalists. The journalists are the ones that are more important than the police. They're the ones that protected them. They're the ones that helped them overthrow the government. They're the path that they took to get their freedom, right? And so in those countries, Al Jazeera is going in and hiring the smartest technical guys in those countries. The kids who overthrow the governments are now building the local offices of Al Jazeera, not because they're paying a lot of money, because they, they want to be involved in journalism. And they're coming up with new models. They're coming up with new ideas. They're building the blogs. Al Jazeera has a huge open source technical team. They're very innovative, very creative, because journalism is, is, is one of the things everyone wants to do, right? And I think that, you know, that, that's part of the you know, thing is people really need to think that journalism is an essential part. I think there's two pieces to that. First, you have to do good journalism, right? Because good journalism shows um, why it's important. But also, I think that you know, the, the citizen media right now, I think it's evolving. But it used to be the citizen media versus the journalists. But now I think the citizen media are the ones who appreciate the journalists the most. Because the citizen media, once you start doing citizen media, you realize how hard it is to do good journalism. Um, when I was doing after the, the tsunami and the reactor, the tw Twitter was the best way for the short-term news. Um, after, afterwards, but as all the news started coming out and it started getting complex, my friends at the New York Times started calling the um, TEPCO and the government and digging in and doing all this research, and they wrote some great articles that we needed in order to understand the context. And if without those journalists, we would never have gotten all the information sorted out in the way that we did. Now, Wikipedia did a good job, but they kept relying also on the professional journalists. So now, all the people on Twitter have huge appreciation for Hiroko Tabuchi of the New York Times and all those professional journalists who really stayed up all night and focused on that. And I think that just like, uh, to be honest, amateur photographers are the ones who, perf who appreciate professional photographers the most, I think amateur journalists are the ones who, who appreciate the professional journalists the most as well. And I think that there's going to be a really interesting relationship where the amateur journalists are the ones who are going to start promoting the professional journalists. Now, it's going to be probably journalists as individuals and certain brands as platforms. But how to turn that into a business model, I think, is something that we really need to explore. But I, I am a strong believer that as long as the average user starts to understand the value of something, it's not that difficult to create a business model as long as you understand how to modify your tools. And it's about also moving the payment position from the place where it originally was to the place where people feel the value. Now, this is kind of, a, again, a fuzzy idea, but to, I'll use a different m metaphor. There's a community in, in Brazil, th various communities who make music. One is called Tecnobrega. And what they do is they, they, the musicians give their music to the street vendors for free. And the street vendors make these CDs and distribute it very cheap. And the kids at school listen to thousands and thousands of these songs and pick their favorite artist. And when they pick the favorite artist, the artist throws a party, and all the kids go to the party, and they pay tons of money to get in the party. And this party generates millions of dollars a month for these artists. And the artists realize that listening to thousands of crappy songs on your iPod is not where the customer is feeling the value. It's when they all at school pick their favorite band, and they take their girlfriend to the event and drink beer and have a party. That's when they're going to open their wallet. So they shifted the payment from the MP3 to the event, right? And it's, it's similarly, I think everyone's thinking about journalism as this, this text. But I have, you know, maybe it's not the text. Maybe it's the relationship with the journalist. Maybe it's sponsoring a journalist. Maybe it's paying in the future for this magazine to exist so that you have the opportunity to read something. Maybe it's connecting with other readers. So if you look, for instance, at the New York Times, there's a vibrant community of commenters on New York Times articles. There's huge um, threads. 
that go off after each um, New York Times article. Well, maybe that community of New York Times readers is like Facebook. Maybe you can figure out a way to monetize the community of fans. You know, and so there's a lot of different ideas that I have. I'm not in the business, so I'm not doing the business models. But, but maybe, you know, the, the, so there's many things. But I don't think the big media companies are looking at those places as, as, as content generation. They have some obsession with this uh, notion of intellectual property. And, and you know, the game, I'll give one more example. The game industry did, was very smart because originally video games were, they used to put quarters into machines in the game parlor. And it was a physical uh, facility business. But when the home video entertainment came out, people could play video games at home. So it switched from a facility rental business to a copyright business, where you sold CDs and you sold game cartridges. But those started to get copied like crazy. So the smart video companies shifted to online gaming. So now World of Warcraft and, and, um, you know, and, and uh, Call of Duty they are making more money than any single, I mean, Call of Duty made a billion dollars. They made, I think, six, I'm trying to remember the number now, but they, I think they, they made more money than any Hollywood movie in history. And they, because they were able to go from physical business to copyright business to network business. And I don't think it takes a genius to be able to move as your medium changes. I think it just takes idiots not to move, right? And I think the problem was, in the music industry, so I'm, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent, but I think the problem is in the music industry and in journalism, I think that the, they, they've, they've gotten very complacent because they've had a very easy business model because they had a monopoly on your attention. Um, and also with, with a lot of this format changes, for instance, in the music business, there's a whole generation of um, music executives who all they did was took album content and converted it to CD because everybody needed to buy a CD of the same thing they already had the album of. And so there was a whole generation of music people who just thought just making CDs from albums was going to make a lot of money. And they didn't innovate at all. And it really kind of destroyed their ability to think in an innovative way. And I think in the, in the publishing industry, I think the difficulty is with respect to journalism is that the people who make the decisions about journalism aren't journalists. So I don't think they really understand the role of journalism in society. And the problem is journalists are so um, it's such a pure art to be a journalist. I mean, you're not supposed to think about money, and you're, not, you're supposed to think about this kind of higher truth. It's very difficult for a journalist to become a business person, I think just kind of by um, training and by mindset. You know? And I think that that's also kind of a handicap for journalism. And that's why I sometimes question whether journalism should really be a business. Maybe there's a way to figure out how journalists should be paid not inside of a company, but inside of some other institution. I don't, and I don't know what that is. Maybe it's nonprofit. Maybe it's state-sponsored. Maybe it's some 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 other way. But anyway, so I don't have an answer. But those are just some ideas. Hi, um, thank you for your explanation of talks. Um, I would like to ask two short questions. Uh, one to Javier. Um, if you forecast. Uh, any change in the Spanish law to allow more openness and openness in, in, in content, so a change in, in property, intellectual property law in the, in the years to come. And the other question is to Joy, um, if, uh, what is the next step to change the um, content system in scientific journals? And what can we do as scientific, as uh, university students, as uh, university lecturers, to change that, to move that system of content in journals? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't understand perfectly your question. Your question um, was? If you forecast uh, yes. for the, the years to come uh, if any change in the Spanish intellectual property law uh, f in order to allow more no. openness? Don't, I don't think so. Don't think so because we have these uh, uh, di di this government that is um, digitally uh, an alphabet. You know they've got no idea about the law, uh, well how things work. The problem is that they don't know how computers work. <laughs> so it's very difficult to make some kind of legislation when where your the Ministry of Culture says that she doesn't understand why we need. Um, uh, Wi-Fi or why or what or, or if you need four mega 
uh, but um, wire uh, connections, etc. So, so in the end, we're speaking with people who has no idea what they are, uh, what they are doing, or what's what's on earth. So, uh, I don't have any expectation for that. Um, if government changes, I believe that um, the Conservative Party, Partido Popular, has a, a different idea, and they think about uh, internet in a different way than uh, this government that we have. But I don't think that they will be able to see uh, the power of the net. And if they do, they will see the power of a closed net, but not the power of the openness. And that is a, a, real, a real problem. Because in, um, around uh, two months ago, three months ago, there was this study that was uh, presented by this foundation from this uh, political party. And the only thing that they spoke about were markets, markets and markets. But the markets were as if the internet was something made by some superior level who used internet in order to produce goods and to sell them, instead of knowing that the net works the opposite way around. Yes, people who do things, and these things can have different channels in order to make business. So business models must come from mm, upside down and from mm, down to up. And they only saw one of the aspects. They were the, the model Telefonica. Okay? Telefonica, the one who's going to guide us and who's going to save us. Okay? And they are going to uh, show us how internet has to be done, built, and how you can make money. So I have no confidence at all in this country uh, in internet. I do have confidence in hackers, but not in government. Um, so scientific journals. Uh, I think there are several different fronts. So there's an organization called the Public Library of Science, which is trying to make um, open access science journals, um, peer-reviewed journals. I mean, and in fact, you know, if you're starting from, by the way, most peer reviewers for academic journals don't get paid, by the way. You know, I mean, th th there's a cost to administrating the peer review, but peer reviewers aren't paid. So the idea that peer review is, um, why you need the money is, is, is it's a fake reason. Um, mainly, these old um, academic journals that have the brand um, have the ability to collect the money because it's just, a, it's just a default place. There are a couple of different things. Some academics that are very tough have just made a decision. They will not publish papers unless they can make them Creative Commons licensed. And some journals have started to accept Creative Commons licensed um, papers so that they're published in the paper, uh, in the journal, but they're also available online uh, under the academics um, page. Now, just for those of you who don't know how academic journals work, is when you publish in an academic journal, you don't have the copyright anymore, so you can't even put it on your own website. And so that's the first step is, I can use it on my website, but I can give it in a journal. Um, there are some journals now who are even, um, like, I think it's uh, the, in, in nature, you know, people who are saying, okay, if we use a Creative Commons license, we will give you um, Creative Commons money because we feel like we're, we're supporting openness. Now, there's, um, there's, there's, there's some trickiness around this because, um, but, but I think the, the, the basic thing that you should try to do as much as possible is to try to negotiate with every academic journal that you're publishing and say, um, I would like to retain the rights to, um, publish this under Creative Commons in addition to giving it to your journal. And they may say no, but the more academics who start asking for this, the more likely the journals will start um, doing it. And then, in some cases, if possible, start using alternatives like Public Library of Science journals um, and start supporting that. And I think what's very important for, as an academic, to start to understand is ask the question, is being published in this journal so important that I'm not going to be able to put it on my website? Because I think more and more in the future, people are finding journals, articles, finding um, papers that you've written through the web rather than through academic journals. Now, again, it really depends on your field. If that academic journal is so important that it requires, it's required in order for you to get tenure, in order for to you to get your job, maybe you have to go in that, that academic journal. But by the way, I don't even have a college degree and I'm the director of the MIT Media Lab, right? So I question the value of publishing in these old journals. And again, it depends on your field. But I have now you know, really bright, really accomplished faculty working for me. And we tell them, you know, don't worry about the journal articles. Focus on making stuff. Focus on the web. And so I think it will slowly change anyway. 
but the way that you can help is insisting on um, Creative Commons licenses for your papers, even with some of these tougher journals. Yeah, I have a question for Mr. Ito. You said something before who was kind of surprising and choking, and it was like in the USA, the MPAA and the RIAA were kind of showing interest or collaborating with Creative Commons. Yeah. Here in Spain, we have uh, some actual problem with these kind of organizations. So I would like you to elaborate a little bit on the subject, because it's kind yeah. of interesting for us. Okay, well, first of all, I'll tell you that ASCAP, which is one of the rights collection societies in um, America, hates that still, right? So they still have a page about why not to use Creative Commons. Um, I've talked to BMI, which is the other rights collection society, and they're very friendly. Um, RIAA, RIAA um, is really a representative of the record industries. Um, I know Kerry Sherman, the head of RIAA. Um, he's a good friend. You know, I, I bought him dinner the other day. Um, but but there, there's actually a, a hearing in Washington, D.C. by the National Academy where they were talking about copyright. And both um, and the head of um, RIAA came out publicly in the hearing in Washington and said that he believed that it was okay to have um, copyright be opt-in so that the default is no copyright but that if you ask for copyright you get it and this is what Lessig has been saying forever which is that the default should be no copyright but if you want copyright you can ask for it and you can get it because this solves this orphan work problem which is that 90% of the stuff that's copyrighted you can't identify the author right and so so we've been pushing it should be optional <coughs> rather than a default um, MPAA also kind of said that in this hearing at the National Academy. So if you search online for <coughs> National Academy RIAA, you can see the uh, quote from the, uh, the RIA. And MPAA, you know, we've had lots of conversations with them. Um, early days, it was, again, very um, tough. With, uh, and Jack Valenti also, is, he's a very smart, interesting guy. He's a very gracious guy, but he also battled us. But these days, you know, because they are starting to understand that well, first of all, we're not as bad as the pirates, right? And we're not, obviously, we're not pirates, um, and that we're providing choice. And it's very difficult with a straight face, if you're representing artists, to say, we don't believe in choice, <laughs> you know? And so publicly, it's very difficult for these guys to argue against Creative Commons now. I think that, you know, in Europe, you still have some collection societies who somehow are able to say, we don't believe in choice, you know? <laughs> But, but I think in the U.S., the debate has gotten to the point where it's difficult. So the only people who can argue against us are the people like ASCAP who lie about what we say, who say that, no, 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 Creative Commons doesn't want choice. They want you to give everything away, which isn't true. Um, so, so in that sense, I think the conversation has become much more rational. Um, I think that uh, the other thing is, you know, the, the uh, uh, YouTube um, uh, uh, lawsuit um, with Viacom and... And these things have started to push the Americans into thinking maybe they are going to have to rewrite the copyright law, and maybe it has to be rational. And so I think a lot of these big players are saying, okay, what are we willing to give up? How can we protect our you know, industry? But I think it's starting to get to the point where, where they don't want to look like irrational players because otherwise they will be ignored. And so I think it's a healthy discussion. We don't know where it's going to go yet. Um, the other thing I would say is WIPO is also becoming quite rational. Uh, the new head of WIPO is actually fairly open. He likes the idea of, he, he even said that WIPO should be, uh, the O in WIPO should be turned to open. <laughs> you know? But the problem is now that WIPO is becoming rational, you have the whole new um, um, organizations like the anti-counterfeit guys um, saying, okay, WIPO is too liberal, let's set up a new organization. So I, it's, you'll never win. But, um, but a lot of these traditional bad guys, bad guys, closed guys, are now being more open. But that's causing new closed guys to be created, I think. Okay, and then, very short, if I can. May I? No. no. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you again for, for your very interesting talk. So I think you, uh, my question is for Joy. Uh, I think you made a couple of very interesting points about the implications of openness for um, uh, scientific production and also for journalism. My question is about um, uh, the recognition of work and also the attributions, because uh, some of the, um, talking with uh, some people in this uh, in uh, science and also in, in journalism, uh, 
especially uh, if they come from the, uh, previous backgrounds in the 70s and 80s, they feel that now it's uh, even more difficult for them to uh, be attributed by their work if, the, if their work is shared uh, so widely uh, because of uh, very permissive licenses like CC BY or CC BY SA. So uh, what, in your opinion, what are the main points that Creative Commons uh, can uh, enforce or can um, enable uh, for them to make, a, uh, like you said before, uh, to make a, a better point of what they are doing to sell their brand as independent journalists, mm -hmm. uh, journalists sorry, uh, and to uh, make their work being uh, attributed and recognized yeah. by others widely. Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to see some data around this because I, I, my my instinct is that Creative Commons attribution use attributes more than any other type of use because if you take something that's copyrighted, you don't want to give attribution because then they may find you. You know, whereas Creative Commons people enjoy being attributed, so you usually give attribution. Um, and sometimes when people remove my, my name and I write them an email, they usually apologize and give me attribution. I've never had a case personally where I've felt like somebody has abused me. Now, legally, after the U.S. Um, ruling recently, a couple of years ago in the federal courts, if you don't give attribution, you are a copyright violator, not just contract breach. So um, Creative Commons enforces most strongly attribution. Um, so. So, it, so, so that's one thing. I think the, the other really important thing is that I think that um, if you look at, in English, it's plagiarism is the use of something without attribution. And plagiarism isn't always co a copyright violation because in the US you have fair use. So I could quote a, night, an, a snippet from you and use it and it wouldn't necessarily be a copyright violation, but if I'm doing an academic paper, it's plagiarism. So even though you don't go to jail, you can get kicked out of school, right? And so plagiarism is not enforced by law. It's enforced by social norms and it's enforced by social rules. And similarly, I think it's important to separate the idea of, um, although Creative Commons can force uh, a legal, uh, enforce um, legal requirement for attribution, I think it's more important to have social requirements for attribution and not just legal requirements. And one of the things that we're working with in Europeana, which is the, the heritage organizations in Europe, I don't know if they're actually going to use this, but they, they liked it and so they're now adopting it, which is one of the problems with a lot of these um, institutions is they have a lot of public domain um, content and they want to share it, but they want to get attribution. So what we created was we created a way to mark a work as public domain, but to ask for attribution and other things. And so what we're saying is by putting all of this data in the metadata, um, even though you don't have a legal requirement to attribute the, the Louvre for this picture, um, you, are, you have a social requirement. And I think that's very important because I think that social requirements should be just as important as legal requirements. I think Americans have the tendency to think that as long as it's legal, it's okay. But I think in Europe you have more of the social norms. And I think what's key for Creative Commons as well is to signal that we're not just a legal institution, that we're a way for people to create a uh, data format. So if you look at RDFA, it puts in the data format, the, the author, the link to the original work, the license that it's under, and if you implement RDFA properly inside of your HTML, if you copy and paste uh, a document, all of the copyright information gets copied with it. So attribution is automatic. And so if you put RDFA and all of the stuff in the metadata, if you took all these clips and put a video, you could make the video editing software automatically give attribution at the end without any extra work from the user. And so a lot of this also will be about how do you build th this kind of metadata into all the tools? Because I think most of the lack of attribution comes from laziness. Um, and, and that's really about the tools and less about the social stuff. So I think it's two things. Um, increase the, the importance of the social norms and stop talking about just the law and also make better software. I will collect uh, the, the last question from Twitter. So I'm going to pick two questions in one. Uh, one says, um, in your opinion, what do you think is more critical or more uh, important in the short term um, for being open, the big companies or the small and medium companies, the one that we call PYME in Spain? 
the word that I told you last night. Uh, and the other question is, um, uh, is, what did you do to convince uh, people from NGOs, uh, from advocacy parties, from uh, social groups to use Creative Commons? But I want to add, I want to add just a, a word in the, in the, um, in the way of uh, translating or convincing people. How do you do that with uh, professors? It is uh, something very important for us. Too. Mm -hmm. How can we um, make them more open to share content and to share the way they teach uh, to the uh, to the students? So how do you do that? Okay. Um, so I, I don't really have a good answer for big companies versus small companies because I think that um, everyone has the opportunity to benefit from being open. And sometimes big companies, if you have good leadership, they do open um, very well. You know? and, and I think that uh, small companies, especially if they are innovating something new, um, coming up with a new model for open works very well too. So I don't, I don't think that there's a either or. Um, but, uh, but I think that if you have a big company which is really in this kind of defensive protective mode, it's very unlikely that they will understand it. But you know, I was just at BBVA yesterday and I, my image of a bank is very you know, closed, but they're very open you know, and they're, using, you know, they're starting to think about Creative Commons and all this other stuff. So I don't think the size matters. Um, and I think with NGOs and professors and things like that, um, uh, I think the best way to, well, first of all, it depends on the professor. I mean, if it's a professor who's not changing what they do, and they do the same thing every s semester, um, and they're happy with that, I don't think they should need to share. But I think that the world is changing, and if you're in a field where you need to learn, and you need to reach out, and you're trying to improve yourself, then what y the best way to improve yourself is to get feedback on what you do. And the most likely way of getting, because if you're only in a classroom, you're only getting feedback from those students. And if you're publishing in a journal, you're only getting feedback from the people who see the journal. If you are truly an academic, you should want critical feedback from as many people as possible. And Creative Commons allows you a couple of things. It allows people to translate your work. Because translation is actually a creation of a derivative work. And under copyright, you can't translate somebody's work uh, without permission. And most people who translate, you find a lot of translation sites. Um, you know, I'm an investor in a company that the fans translate videos. And you know, they, like a Korean drama will be translated in two days and 48 hours into 40 languages by the fans. But they're doing it because it's fun. Not, they, don't, they wouldn't write a letter to do this, right? And so I think translation into languages and also um, bloggers blogging it and reciting it so this, again, has a lot to do with, let, let, me, let me shift gears for one second, because I think the professor issue is a very important one. There's two types of opinions about how you find truth. You know, I was actually talking to somebody from the CIA, you know, and the CIA d thinks that they try to find the one person in the world who knows the most about something, and they ask that person for the answer. On the internet, what you do is you put an idea on the internet, and if it survives, it's the truth. Because every single person in the world attacks it. And if you can win the argument on the internet, it's probably true. And it's really a crowdsourced wisdom versus the expert, right? And I think that if you're a professor who believes that authority is truth, then open doesn't really help you. But if you are somebody who believes that winning an argument is the truth, then what you want is you want to have all of the inputs. And it's, it's, it's a rigorous, um, uh, uh, to have a rigorous debate. Now, I think that, that the social media and blogs have still a lot more improvement to, to go, but it's gotten s quite good. So that if you post something, whether it's in mainstream media or anywhere else, um, and it gets translated into many languages, people will have a debate about it, and you will always learn something from it. And so I think the question to the, to the, journal, uh, to the professor is, are you interested in learning or only teaching? Because if they're interested in learning, then they, sh they have to be open. Um, and I think with respect to NGOs and, and, and nonprofits, um, it's, it's obvious that it has to be open because um, it's just about distribution, right? And any closeness, like every single person who, um, like I, I, I do television and stuff too, if you have to send a fax and get an approval from somebody, you're not 
if you're not if you're busy you're not going to do it so for instance if you're an NGO that's promoting something and you have a picture and somebody is in the middle of doing a live news show about that topic they will if they have a video clip that says that they can use it um, they'll use it but if they have to write and wait for a response they're not going to use it so if you are sending all of your messages out under a Creative Commons license it's much more likely to be picked up by mainstream media and Al Jazeera is a very good example right so Al Jazeera broadcast, I mean, put all of this stuff online, and it appeared in all kinds of television shows and, and video games and books all over the world. I mean, it's all over Wikipedia. Wikipedia is almost like an advertisement for, for Al Jazeera now, because it's everywhere, right? So if you're, if you're an NGO and you're trying to get your brand and your message out, there's nothing like making it open to make it go everywhere. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Joy, Lisa, Javier. Thank you, all of you, for coming here, for being here with us uh, today for the presentation of the book. We, uh, we, we are very happy to, to host this event in our school, at the EOI school. And now we invite you to, to have a drink and to network a little bit around with us for, for a while, for half an hour as much, because uh, Joey has to leave uh, to the airport. But he, he was also very interested in, in joining all of us in a, in a more informal way. So we just drop out <laughs> from the from the seat and join you now. Thank you. <laughs>